notice something here in the book of Titus, for example, chapter 2 and verse 7. In all things, showing thyself a pattern of what? Good works. works. Verse 14, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of what? Good works. Chapter 3, verse 1, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every, what is that? Good work. Verse 8, this is a faithful saying. And these things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. This is, uh, these things are good and profitable unto men. And then, of course, verse 14, and let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses that they be not unfruitful. Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for who you are as a loving God of goodness, grace, mercy, and uh, tender kindness. We thank you, Father, that we can rejoice knowing that uh, our eternal destiny is sealed and secure in and through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, this morning as we look to your word, may we rejoice in your creative design in, in, in manufacturing us for the specific purpose of producing good works. We pray that your word would work effectually, may it impact the way we think about our lives, but more importantly, may it impact the way we think about the culture in which we live in, and may it impact uh, the way we view you. And of course, we ask these things in Christ Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. It's quite interesting here, uh, the Apostle Paul obviously has a very high view of good works. And I emphasize that because as grace believers, the term good works isn't always high in our vocabulary. And uh, we want to, of course, have a proper view of good works. The Apostle Paul, in his epistles, makes a direct reference to good works or good work or do good at least 20 times. Interestingly enough, half of those references, half of the direct references to good works are found in the pastoral epistles. Ten times, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and the, in the book of Titus, we have the Apostle Paul directly referring to good works. Now, there are many other occasions in which the Apostle Paul indirectly refers to good works, but we're just going to examine the use of that term, good works. I want to read something from a book. Uh, there is a book titled, How Christianity Changed the World. It was written by Alvin Schmidt. Uh, I confess to you, I read the Cliff Notes version. It's a relatively long book, but, uh, and we want to be careful with the use of the name Christian. We're going to use that a little bit loosely. Uh, you know, it's uh, sometimes relative in the last 2,000 years of history. But uh, the, emphasis, the, the purpose of this book is to demonstrate the impact that the Bible-believing view uh, had on Western civilization. And uh, I just want to read a couple of these uh, excerpts, and again, uh, be mindful that we now have, you know, revisionists that are trying to rewrite history and pretty much uh, ex dismiss the impact that Bible-believing Christianity has had in human history. When you examine the impact that Christianity has had, you discover some wonderful things, the impact regarding the value of human life. The, the impact that Christianity had on the practice of, uh, of abortion or child abandonment or human sacrifice or infanticide or even suicide. The impact that Christianity had uh, in institutions of compassion and charity, for example, hospitals, health care, uh, um, uh, adoption uh, ministries, the impact that Christianity has had on education, the impact that it has had on human rights and liberty and justice and laws and economic freedoms, the impact that Christianity has had regarding the honor and dignity of women and women's rights, the 
opposition to slavery, the impact on race relations, the impact that Christianity has had on science, art, literature, music. And I'm going to borrow a statement that the author makes, and I'm going to paraphrase it just a little bit. He writes, the early Christians did not set out to change the world. They set out to win people to Jesus Christ, whose transformed lives affected the world. You see that? You see, the early Christians, they set out to rescue the world, not trying to reform or change the world. The gospel ministry is a mission of divine rescue. And it is such a testimony to the work of God within His people to have such an effect, such an influence on human culture. I wanted to preface our lesson this morning by taking note historically of the impact of Bible-believing Christians. We're going to be talking about good works. And when we look at the issue of good works in Paul's epistles, we're going to look at five areas, and that's why I have the PowerPoint right now. We're going to look at the impact, uh, or I should say the relationship between good works and salvation, the relationship between good works and identification, the relationship between good works and edification, the, imp the relationship between good works and our motivation, and then ultimately the relationship between good works and application. And uh, interesting, when you study Paul and the references that he makes to good works, he doesn't provide an exhaustive list as to what are they. Kind of interesting. And there's good reason why we don't have an exhaustive list of, well, what are these good works? Now, what we do want to note is this. In the pastoral epistles, and we're not going to read all of these references, we read the ones that are found in the book of Titus, there are two reasons why Paul is emphasizing good works in the pastoral epistles. Number one, what Paul is doing is equipping and preparing the body of Christ for apostasy, the impending apostasy that is going to rise within the ranks of the church. But secondly, interestingly enough, in 1st, 2nd Timothy and in the book of Titus, Paul is also preparing the body of Christ for the moral breakdown in culture. Paul says some things, for example, about human government. Go over to 1st Timothy real quickly, 1st Timothy. And uh, you, you have to wonder, why is Paul in the pastoral epistles, as they are conveniently called, uh, why is he making reference to human government? For example, 1 Timothy chapter 2, beginning there at verse 1, I exhort therefore, and if we have time, we'll examine, well, what is it Paul's driving at here, but I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may, and this is, this is key, that we may what? Live? I thought it says live. Lead. Is there a difference between praying that I may live a quiet and peaceable life and praying so that I might lead? You know that we are the leaders of heaven while we're here on planet Earth, okay? So, so anyway, that we may, might, may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. Listen, we examine the doctrine of good works and realize that good works has a place and purpose within the culture and society that God's people find themselves in. And so in light of the absolute disintegration of cultural morality, the amoral sentiment that is going to pollute a culture, you and I have the privilege of literally impacting 
our culture. Don't view culture as an enemy. View culture as a mission field. So go over to uh, chap- uh, 2, Tim- 2 Timothy chapter 3. Just again, appreciate how Paul is preparing the church for the apostasy within the ranks of the church, but once again, also the disintegration of cultural norms, morality. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, I'm sorry, chapter uh, Yes, 3 verse 1, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce bakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, uh, uh, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. This is a reference to what's happening in culture. And then, of course, going back there to Titus chapter 3, we already read this passage, but Titus chapter 3 verse 1, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers. You see the issue of government, human government? Now notice, to be ready to every what? Ultimately, we're going to discover the greatest deterrent to government harassment to government intimidation, the greatest defense and deterrent against the anti-Christian sentiment that is clearly occurring even in this day. The greatest deterrent to the opposition and potential persecution at the hands of society. According to the Apostle Paul, maintain good works. It has an effect. God desires to have the stamp of his righteousness within a culture. Now, let's talk about these five areas. Number one, we need to have a proper understanding regarding good works in relationship to salvation. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and fear not, we're not going to park on every one of these areas. Uh, But if anything, let's just provide a a bit of a brief overview. And of course, as grace believers, we rightly divide the word of truth. We certainly, of all people, need to have a crystal clear understanding of good works in relationship to salvation. And there is no relationship, (laughs) uh, to put it quite simply. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. When it comes to the formula of eternal life, when it comes to the forgiveness of sins, when it comes to having a position of absolute righteousness before Almighty God, being forgiven of all our trespasses and sins, having eternal life as a permanent possession that can never be lost, It can never be by human effort, by human sincerity, by human merit. It can never happen based upon a person's works. Paul writes in Titus chapter 3, not by works of righteousness which we have done. So immediately, in regards to salvation unto eternal life, good works are excluded from the equation. And I always think about what Pastor Russ Hargett said, the only thing that a person can contribute to their salvation is what? Their sin. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. God will not allow good works to factor in to His glorious gift of eternal life, which is based upon His grace and ultimately based upon His provision on our behalf. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by what? His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. God the Father is the one who intervened and moved on the behalf of a lost, dead, sinful world. He's the one 
who literally placed upon the altar of Calvary, he set forth his son, freely motivated by his grace. He was not moved by any attempt on the sinner's part to try to be right, to try to be good, to try to be holy, to try to, make, to, try to improve. No, God the Father, in violent fashion, not in passive, carefree surrender. He violently placed His Son on that altar, making Jesus Christ, His own beloved Son, sin. That was an ugly event, by the way. An ugly, violent event on the cross of Calvary, where God the Father, who made His own Son, sin for us all, and it was God the Father who exercised the brutality of His offended justice. The propitiation was the very object in which the violated offense of God was brutally poured out. Listen, that wasn't His Son on the cross. What did Jesus say in Psalms 22? I am not a man. I'm a worm. And the Father concurred. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In Romans chapter 8, this is a powerful verse. Romans chapter 8, verse 32. He, reference to God, that spared not. You understand? Oh, I, 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 I'm touched. But, you know, we, I have kids. We have grandkids. And if I saw my grandchild in pain and suffering unjustly and needlessly, I would, I would, I would intervene. There, there's a part of who we are when we see an innocent being falsely brutalized and accused and wronged and offended. There's a part in each and every one of us. And if it were my son, and my son isn't perfect, but here you have the father who literally is going to brutalize his son by way of wrathful fury and vengeance against your sin and my sin. To spare not means God the Father literally showed no mercy. He literally, excessively punished his son. That's what propitiation is. Now, if you go to Romans chapter 11, real quick, Romans chapter 11, you see, this is why salvation can never include good works. Because there was only one work that counts before the offended God of the universe, and that was the work of His beloved Son, who willingly said, Father, blame me for the sins of the world. We read there in Romans chapter 11, verse 6, And if by grace, then it is no more of what? It's a contradiction. Are we saved by grace or are we saved by works? Are, 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 we, are we saved by proving our worthiness through works? We are sinners. We are. Just come to God as you are, a sinner in desperate, absolute need of a kind, loving, gracious Father who justly paid for all of our sins by making His Son His own propitiation for all of our sins. And the principle stands for all of eternity. If it's by grace, then it is no more of works. Go back to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to now move on to the second area. So, so at the outset, we want to make absolutely crystal clear. Good works in the life of the believer is not to earn merit or gain eternal life, salvation. The two are mutually exclusive. The twain can never and shall never meet. So, when we talk about good works, as penned by the Apostle Paul, the Apostle of the Gentiles, what is it that we need to know about good works? We're back here in Ephesians chapter 2, right? Let's once again read verse 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that... Not of yourselves. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> it is the gift. Freely 
by his grace. Verse 9, not of works, lest any man should boast. Verse 10 deals with the issue of our identification. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, notice, on two good works. So let that sink in for a second. When we launch out into a quest of good, a life of good works, we need to understand that the good works that the body of Christ is exhorted to perform, be careful, be zealous, maintain good works. It is hinged upon the foundational truth that our God as a workman, he's a master craftsman, by the way, He's, he is a glorious artisan. You see, you understand what it means to be a workman, right? Whether it's a fabricator or a carpenter or a poet or an artist, God, he took the worst, worthless material that is found in verses 1, 2, and 3. Only a master craftsman can take the material, for example, in verse 1, and you... <laughs> Stop. <laughs> Who? You, you, and you, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among all, whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, we were naturally the children of wrath. And guess what God is capable of doing? Because he's a master craftsman. God alone can take that worthless, unprofitable refuse, this, this filth. And he said, I'm going to create something gloriously new. He takes that material. And of course, we want to emphasize, in Christ Jesus, he literally creates something. Now, we're not going to you know, dwell with the issue of a, a workman. You know... Uh, whether you're an artist, whether you're a, a, a craftsman, a, a manufacturer, uh, it's quite interesting that a workman will express their thinking, their sentiments, via their hand, via their workmanship. So what God is doing, and now there's a corporate application here, the church, the body of Christ is this creature. God is expressing something about his being and person through the handiwork of his own very hand, his workmanship. And what is it that occupies the sentiments and the thinking and the mind of God? Well, he's created something. And, and let's think about that word create for just a second. Doesn't that take us back to Genesis 1? Remember how God created, he created, created. And, and, and then you learn and find out that, that whatever God created, uh, you, you have this replication after its kind. Whether God created a tree, God created a plant, whether God created a dog, whether God created man out of the dust of the field, God embedded into that creature the very blueprint designed to do the very thing God intends for that creature to do. I hope I didn't just, you know, go be When God created Adam, he embedded into that DNA all, some characteristics. God has a design. How many of you have blue eyes? Did you have a choice in the matter? How many of you have green eyes? I have green eyes. Did we have a choice in the matter? We didn't have much choice. When God created something in Christ Jesus, I want you to appreciate this. Let's read verse 10 again. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. How? For what? Do you have a choice in the matter? Oh, we got a little hesitant. Now we'll finish the verse. Don't worry about it. But wait a minute. God's master crowning achievement is this new creature in his son, Jesus Christ, which, by the way, is the church, the body of Christ. If any man be in Christ, he is a new 
creature. In Christ, God has provided a blueprint. We possess the very spiritual DNA that destines us unto what? You have no choice. Think about that. You see, good works is not the attempt on our part to keep God happy, to make God happy, to appease an offended judge. Wait a minute, from God's point of view, He's already written the instructions within the subatomic level of our spiritual identity. Please understand this. We, part of our spiritual identity, we're created onto, you've got no say in the matter. That's God's design. Now, we want to exercise a little caution here, right? When a baby, can a human become more human? Can a, Billy Graham, he once said, an oak tree can never become more oakier. <laughs> How true that is. When, 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 when that egg is fertilized in mother's womb, the DNA has already determined its ultimate destiny. It's going to be a human being. It's not a human one day after it fertilizes in mom's womb. It isn't a, it isn't a human being one day after it pops out of the womb. It doesn't become a human being 10 years, 30 years, 70 years. God designed by way of DNA. He created humanity. And the instructions are there. It's already there. Now, we need to understand something about growth, development, and maturation. We understand that. What I'm getting at is this. If God created something, he created in Christ Jesus a creature, the church, the body of Christ, that possesses the blueprint, which is a replication of what his son is going to achieve for all of eternity. You've got no choice. You've got no say in the matter. Just like you can't choose to change the color of your eyes. Biologically. Now I understand there's some weird things that are going out there. Okay? You, you understand what I'm getting at here, okay? Now go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. So let's appreciate that concept of creation. Uh, because all too often, believers have it, you know, the cart before the horse kind of a thing. Well, wait a minute. Good. We never perform good works to obtain life. We perform the good works because we have life. It's already in our spiritual identity. It's there. Now, we don't always appreciate it. In fact, we don't always understand it. But is it already written within our spiritual identity? God created it, not me. Ephesians chapter 1, look there at verse, uh, for example, uh, verse 22, we're breaking it right in. Verse 22, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him, Christ Jesus, to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. Now notice, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Uh, th this word fullness, Sean, are you, you know, we had a little chat about biology. Uh, do you know how the word fullness is used in the sciences, whether it's biology and so forth? Fascinating. The, the, the word fullness in relationship to physical properties and atomic particles and so forth, fascinating. Biology defines fullness as a basic or essential attribute shared by all members of a class. We're the full, we are the literal expression and manifestation of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you understand that we are literally a physical extension of his person? Do you understand the book of Ephesians? We are bone of his bone. And what? We're his fullness. We share in common with our living Lord and Savior some attributes. We're his fullness. We are literally this expression, which is a replication of who he is. We're created. Our identity determines our destiny. And I just want you to appreciate that's who you are. That is who. Don't strive to do. Enjoy just being. Think about that. You got this, and we're going to talk about legalism. By the way, legalism is absolutely terrified by some things. 
that we're going to look at. So now go back to Ephesians 2, verse 10, quickly, verse 10. For we are his workmanship. And by the way, when God creates a masterpiece, does he ever mess up? <laughs> Listen, whatever he does is good stuff. We don't appreciate it, but that's God's. What it, you know what occupies his thinking? He looks, he looks at you, and he says, look at my crowning achievement. And what do we do? I'm not worth it. You, you see how we talk ourselves out of who we really are? Listen, we'll say some more about that. God looks at you, and he says, my work of art in Christ Jesus. We are his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus unto good works. Now notice, which God hath before ordained that we, what? Should walk in them. Now we're going to look at this third. Here's my PowerPoint. I don't need all that. Uh, edification. Okay, good works in relationship to edification. Now notice, it's already written in our blueprint, the DNA, but we should walk in them, right? Go over to chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, and notice in chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk. You see that word walk? Now remember, we're destined unto good works. You can't change that. We should walk in them. Well, how do we walk in them? Let's take that baby, okay? Uh, my little, we you know, I'm a grandparent now, three times over. And, uh, of course, uh, the baby girl's the most beautiful one, you know. Oh, the boys are okay. But the, the baby girl, she's just a, an absolute doll. You know, when Rachel, when, when, when our daughter-in-law, Rachel and son, when they came over with Anara, I don't know, she was maybe a few weeks old, I didn't ask Rachel, hey, shouldn't she be walking by now? I want you to think about that for a second. But was Inara created to walk? Now, normally, I understand there are exceptions. Normally, we all have two legs. And, and please, I'm not trying to, to, to ridicule anyone who may have a physical leg. But, but normally, we're created with two legs, right? Can't, you have no choice. But now, when you popped out of the womb, you didn't start walking. My little baby granddaughter, Inara, she, she didn't walk. But I didn't scold her. Come on, Inara. You know, I didn't take a four-week-old and, you know, <laughs> you know drag, like the little turtle, you know. Um, but now, what if Alex one day, when Inara is 10 years old, and he's just carrying her everywhere? Would I be justified in asking, shouldn't she be walking by now? You understand the concept here? You possess the DNA that enables you to walk in good works. But we need to know something about, well, how do we do that? Chapter 4, verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye, here we go, walk. Now notice the next word, worthy. You know, the uh, worthy, in the Sunday school, we're using that uh, illustration of a balance, a scale. Remember the, uh, you know, 1,000 years ago, if you wanted to buy a pound of flour, correct? Well, how do you know you're getting a pound of flour? Well, the merchant, you would hope, is an honest merchant, and he would have a one-pound weight. And you have the scale, right? So he would put the one-pound weight on one side of the scale, and boom. And so, okay, I want a pound of flour. You slowly begin to place flour on the other part. And, and what begins to happen? You begin to have equilibrium. The idea of walking worthy, that carries with it the idea of balance, of, of equilibrium. Equilibrium. So in other words, what God is now going to do as we commence studying chapter 4 is he's going to provide the necessary doctrine that takes your destiny created onto good works and puts it into living, demonstrable reality. We don't have to wait until we're in glory to carry out the good works that God has destined us for, in which it has to do with the heavenly places, we're learning we now can be the full manifestation and expression of the attributes of our Savior, Jesus Christ, by way of what? Good works. How do we begin to tap into that? Listen, walk worthy. So what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to bring into balance, and you understand the walk, we bring into balance some key doctrines that the Apostle Paul here lays out. Verse 1, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that ye walk worthy of the what? What's your vocation? Are we not the fullness of Jesus Christ? 
Are we not his body? Are we not bones of his bones and flesh? Are we not created unto good works? That's our vocation. How am I going to walk worthy of it? I'm not going to fault my two-week-old granddaughter because she can't walk. She needs to learn how to do so. I'll have a problem when she's 30 and, she's not, and she won't walk. But look at the core, essential, fundamental doctrines that are now going to be listed. Now, of course, there's an attitude, verse 2, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. As we study these foundational doctrines, we begin to recognize who we are, created onto good works, and now I can bring into equilibrium, into equal balance, who I am, created onto good works, into a living manifestation in the details of my life. The fullness of Him that filleth all in all. We talk about, keep your finger here in Ephesians 4, go over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. I would be remiss if we did not go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. The only way we can bring our position in equilibrium to our practice is God's given to us a curriculum. He's given to us, obviously, in general, His Word. But we're going to move a little bit beyond that. For now, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. 2 Timothy 3, 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that, now here we go, the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all what? There's that working. But always remember, God has a very high view of good works. That's how he created us. He has a high view. Now, opponents of grace, opponents of dispensation, uh, the critics of grace, legalists, they go ballistic when we start teaching some things about grace. Okay, and we'll, we'll address that in just a second. But here we have God who gives, verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Okay, God has a high expectation. Uh, God has a high view on good works, but it doesn't happen in a vacuum, does it? Uh, we didn't pop out of mom's womb and start running and producing and performing. God's Word is designed to equip, uh, uh, to instruct the man of God. Now, the man of God, that's not limited to males biologically. The man of God in contrast to what? Go back to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. That we henceforth be no more what? Okay, in the Bible, if you're not a child, you're a man. You're an adult. That's the idea, okay? So, in light of Ephesians 4, how do we walk worthy? Well, here are some core foundational doctrines that we need to understand. Seven of them, by the way. And, and we, Paul begins to, to amplify a little bit. He begins to progress through the passage. And, and the purpose in the intent, verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may, here we go, grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto itself, uh, unto the edifying of itself in love. So we understand something. There is a stage of edification. God's word in general provides the instruction that will equip the believer to move beyond infancy, to, to move beyond adolescence, so that we know longer function and think and react and respond like a child, but that we can be a man of God, a spiritual adult, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. God wrote it in our spiritual DNA, and God's Word now will empower us to bring it into equal balance, okay? But more than that, more than just God's Word in general, Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and Brother John was here in Titus, but uh, real quick, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Um, yes, God's Word. It's alive, it's quick, it's powerful, it's sharper. 
It affects change. It produces life in the realm of the inner man. But today, in the dispensation of grace, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we learn something. The one who exhorts the body of Christ onto good works. Be zealous, be careful, maintain it. It's profitable. The same one who wrote those exhortations is the same one, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every, what is that? Good work. Now, notice the correlation. What is it that's going to result abounding? And you don't understand the abounding concept, right? Listen, God isn't merely saying, oh, Tap into your identity, created unto all good, and, and just give me a little crumb-like. We are created to abound. And I've used this illustration before. Can you envision a thirsty man getting a drink from Niagara Falls? That river, Niagara, it abounds with what? Water. There is this endless flow of water. God created us to be a source of endless, abounding flow of what? Good work. But notice verse 8. And God, who is able to make all, here it is, grace. Grace. What is going to motivate a believer today? to literally tap into that resource of, uh, of good work. Paul says it's grace. Titus chapter 2, verse 14. And why do we have to recognize that? Go to Titus chapter 2 and then Romans chapter 7. You know, there are two principal ways in which a believer can, quote, perform good works. Paul is always emphasizing grace. Grace, grace is the curriculum. Grace is the program. Grace is the operating system that is designed to bring into our walk, into equal, equilibrium, our created identity. Grace. What is the, the opposite of grace? Now, before we go there, Titus chapter 2, verse 11 for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. And of course, verse 12, teaching. Grace. Grace as a system of revelation. Go to Romans chapter 7. And, and I want to contrast this to another system that can produce good. Okay? Romans chapter 7. Now, Paul, thank goodness, he, 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 was, he had enough self-assurance in himself, to honestly describe his utter failure. And you know what he's doing in Romans chapter 7, right? He's dealing with the, the law, okay? And he, he writes something really interesting in Romans chapter 7. Notice in verse 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, is Paul seeking to do good? Does Paul have a sincere heart and desire? I'm going to prove I love you, Lord, and I sincerely want to do your will, and I want to worship and serve, and blah, blah, blah. Is Paul sincere when he says, I want to do good? But did you catch what he writes in verse 18? At the, but how to perform that which is good? I find not. Now, what Paul is describing here is the law. And Paul, he thought, I'll do good. And he resorted and reverted back to a time past dispensational program called the law, which simply put is the carrot on the stick Motivation, okay? So he goes to the law, and certainly doesn't the law say thou shalt not steal? 
Let's use that for an example. Thou shalt not steal. Well, that's a good thing. So Paul, he now imposes upon himself a legal principle. I am going to do good. The problem with the law is stated by Paul in verse 18. You know what the law does? The law says, thou shalt not steal, right? When I, when I was a teen, I was a dumb teenager, like I think a few of you. You know, I had my old Chevy Vega. Anyway, I'm living in Chicago, Granville. Anyway, so it's a winter, it's snowing, it's slush, it's, it's cold out, and I have a flat tire, okay? And like a dumb teenager, I didn't probably even have a jacket on. So long story short, so I have a flat tire, and I'm on Granville Avenue there near Ridge. And so, so okay, I'm going to change the tire. Then like an idiot, I just sort of, you know, pulled over to the side, okay? And, uh, you know, I remember the old jacks in the 70s. And, and so I got the car. The rear end is jacked up. And all of a sudden, I see the blue lights. Ooh. And so a police officer comes out, and he says, what are you doing? Well, okay, what am I doing? You know, I'm, I'm changing the tire. And he said, well, you know, the rear end of your vehicle is blocking, uh, it's impeding traffic, you know. I said, well, yeah, I mean, but, you know, I got a flat tire. He says, you got to move it out of here. I said, well, okay, I'm trying, you know, you, know, you want to, don't want to cause it. I said, well, I'm, I'm trying, I'm, 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 I'm trying to change the tire. He says, well, and he, he repeated, he says, listen, uh, your vehicle is impeding the flow of traffic. You got to move it away. I said, but it's on the jack. And, and, so, he, he, and so I looked at him, I remember, and I, and I asked, I said, can you help me? He looked at me, and he said, I can't do that. The same law that said, you are impeding traffic, is the same system that says, I can't help you. You know what Paul is saying? He went to that system, and he's going to try in the energy of his own flesh. He's going to say, listen, that system says thou shalt not steal. But you know what the problem with that law is? It'll tell you what your problem is but it can't help you. You see, when Paul says how to perform, he's saying it doesn't supply the power. You see, that's the problem. It's like a thermometer, right? A thermometer will reveal that you have a fever. Can it reduce it? You see the, 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 fault, the problem with the law, and, and we're in the context, I know that, Romans 7, verse 5, Romans 7, verse 5, for when we were in the flesh... The motions of sins, which were what? By the law. Please, the law didn't cause you to sin. Rather, the law identifies the fundamental core problem. And what, when, when Paul says the motions of sins, which were by, he's saying, listen, uh, by way, the motions of sins, which are known and revealed by way of the instrumentality of the law, just like, hey, I have a fever. How do you know that? By way of the thermometer. Okay, so Paul, he begins to address the problem with the law. The motions of sins, the inward passions and the desire, the inner, the inner power, the sentiment. You see, here's the problem. There is an internal flaw in the sinner. And the law was a system of outward behavioral performance. It was a system of behavioral conditioning. All it could do was say, you can't do it. You're supposed to do that, but how do I do it? Sorry, that I can't help you with. But the law does expose the core problem. The motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto what? Verse 8, but sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence for without sin. Uh, no, listen, sin wrought. In Listen, the law did not cause Paul to, to, to perform in all manner of concupiscence, okay? The law said, there it is. There you go again. There's the problem. Verse 11, for sin, taking occasion by the commandment, again, deceived me. The, the law didn't deceive. Sin deceived me. Now, this is interesting, verse 13. Was then that which is good made death unto me, God forbid, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become what? Wait a minute. The law says thou shalt not steal. How does that become exceedingly sinful? The law says it's wrong to steal. The act of stealing is sin. But the law does more than that. It reveals it's worse. It's exceeding, it demonstrates 
you have an inward problem. You see, you committed the act of stealing the act because you are a sinner by nature. The law can never change you from the inside. It can never empower the believer. It can never transform. The, the, the law was never intended to change the inward man. So Paul, by thinking, I will do good. He thought he would do it by way of rules and regulations and ordinances and, and, and do's and don'ts and so on and so forth. Paul learned a, a critical lesson here. Chapter 6, verse 14. Chapter 6, verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under what? Grace. You know what the legal, again, this is scandalous. This is terrifying. This is, uh, this brings fear to a heart of a legalist. Wait a minute. You mean we're not under a law system which is intended to promote righteousness? Aren't we under a law system that is going to deter evil and resist sin in life. The problem with the legalists, they're going to argue, you know why we're supposed to be performing good works? We're to perform good works because God is holy. You know what Paul says? We perform good works because we're holy. Wait a minute. My spiritual identity, I am created onto good works. The legalists will argue that we do good works because we're bound by the spirit of the law. Paul says, we perform good works because we're free from the law. The legalist is going to argue that we perform good works to obtain the blessings from Almighty God. Paul says we perform good works because we've already been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Listen, grace is teaching us a valuable lesson. Our identity created on two good works can only be accessed when we understand that this is how God deals with each and every one of us. God says, I have fully, unconditionally, endlessly, and permanently forgiven you. I've accepted you. I love you. I bless you. I've given it to you all at the start. And you can't lose it. And you can't, you can't just dismiss the grace of Almighty God. So what we learn, grace is the power and the motivation that will ultimately cause that created being in Christ Jesus to abound unto every good work. Now we're going to move on. Uh, the, the motivation, very, very quickly, Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. And of course, we want to also recognize motivation. The motivation, Galatians chapter 5, especially Paul, he, he, he addresses the issue of motivation. But for sake of time, Galatians 5 verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the what? Liberty. Liberty. You're free. You're, you're free. Now, again, you have the legalists that will charge the, the grace believer. Uh, you're just, you know, promoting, you know, sin. You know, grace is a license to sin. Uh, grace is just, you know, carelessness. And it's, it's an excuse for laziness. It's an excuse for self-indulgence. It's, it's an excuse to, to live a life of self-determination. And you're just, you're just uh, excusing a lack of holy living and, and all sorts of baloney. Uh, by the way, it is possible. See, grace demands that it's possible that you might live in sin that you might use it as an excuse to fulfill the lust of the flesh, that, that, that you might live lazy, carefree. Otherwise, it isn't grace. It isn't liberty. Liberty by default. God, God took the risk in giving us the complete package of endless, unconditional blessing, and he risked the possibility that we may not exercise all of that to his glory. Why would he do that? Why would God risk all of that? Because he believes that his grace, motivated by love, will actually work. And I said this, to, God has more confidence in us than we do in ourselves. God believes in you. God believes in you in Christ Jesus and what it is he's doing. God is so confident that his grace, motivated by love, will produce the good works that he's created us onto. Now, I tell you, I tell you what. We got to stop. <laughs> uh, the motivation, it's love. It's love. 
The love of Christ constraineth me. Here's the Father says, you're already blessed. You can't gain any more, and you can't lose what you already have. You've got it all. Yeah, but what if I choose to do, for example, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13. Uh, um, look there at Galatians chapter 5 and uh, verse 13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Now, it's possible. And it's possible, but, 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 but the Lord has greater confidence in all of that. Love is the motivation. And, and then lastly, application. And, and obviously, we're, we're going to have to finish up here. So, so let's go to Titus chapter 3, all right? And, you know, it's interesting when Paul writes about society, culture, government, and so on, he brings up the issue of, of good works. Don't we live in a toxic, mean, divisive, polarizing environment right now in our society? Man, and you know as well as I do, anti-Christian sentiment, it's on the rise. It's going to get uglier and it's going to get worse. And, and you know, we want it, you know, it certainly was bad 2,000 years ago, you know. And so when Paul in chapter 3, verse 1, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil, of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Listen, that's who we were. We used to walk in the course of this world. We used to have the spirit of this world, the way of thinking, the mental disposition that motivated us and energized to live for self, me, myself, and I. And, and on that whole listing, we're, we were guilty of all of it. When Paul brings up the issue of good works, notice verse 1 is a bookend. And then you go down to verse 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which believe in God might be careful to maintain what? Verse 1 and verse 8 are bookends. That tells us that the verses in between has to be understood and can only be understood in its context. Why is Paul emphasizing good works, good works, good works? Because we live in a dangerous, evil, ignorant, dead world. And the good work, the best thing that a believer can do, don't fight don't engage in the name-calling and in the finger-pointing. And, 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 you know, we see the church sadly falling victim to that kind of a tactic. That's not who we are. We, we, listen, who were we used to be a part of all that. Verse 4, but after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. I want to run just a few verses. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. First Thessalonians, the, the greatest thing that we as the church, the body of Christ can do in relationship to our culture and society isn't to demean, it isn't to, it isn't to uh, uh, slander, it isn't to fight. You know, we're created unto what? Let's be the fullness of Christ. Let's be who we are because we want to rescue people. We want to exemplify our identity as citizens of heaven. And, and uh, we have verses, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Look there at verse 12. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward who else? All oh, men. Wow. Verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 15. Chapter 5, verse 15. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to who? Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you, Father, for that identity that you've given to us in and through your Son, Jesus Christ, created with the capacity to perform the very thing you designed us for onto good works. May we uh, begin to allow the, the work of your grace and the power of your love to, to transform the way we view life, the way we would view our current culture, the way we would view uh, the political landscape and the societal uh, um, uh, compass. May we be who we are, seeking to do good, knowing that you would have all men to be saved and come under the knowledge of the truth.